these uh, critiques are uh, a way for me to see what's going on and what I need to do in teaching this course, what you're doing and what sort of help you need. And, uh, and so this would be my drawing uh, for those of you who are still not familiar with this method. It's a way for me to get really in touch with what's going on here. So my critique is here, and then the original is here. I picked a good one, Leon's. There were other good ones. You people clearly are ready for uh, the six-hour poses, if not more, because there's a lot that's been found on this drawing in the limited amount of time, because if you think about it, it's about two hours and ten minutes of drawing time. It says three on the schedule, but it's, uh, it's quite informed. So when I take these along, I try to pick out one or two things, not everything to talk about. I don't have time. I think the size is good on this, and uh, the study of its planes, and uh, the relationships in space, and so on. So let's see what I was talking about. I usually try to go through the whole thing, just because I believe in that, at a certain size, because I believe in that, there's tradition for that. Drawing at this size, which is 1824, it was felt in the days of the French Academy that were you to make a life study at this size, it would give you enough information, even in its lesser parts, like hands, such that you could take a studied and finished drawing done at this size and use it for your painting, whatever size your painting was. Anything smaller than this begins to reduce this, and the hands get small, and the decision making with respect to the smaller parts is sacrificed some, and you don't have enough information to go to your painting, for example. That's, a, that's the legacy of 18 by 24. Because those old French drawings are about 17 by 25. So it's a sense, essentially the same proportion. For good reason, because there were at least 200 years where drawing paintings were informed by drawings. That's why we're working at this size. So therefore, I urge people to work at this size. Now, I, my, this, in criticism of this, criticism isn't quite the right word, in response to the original drawing, was uh, <coughs> simplifying the angles of things in order to get at the truth uh, rather quickly, just from the point of view of perception and also identification of some bone points. And so that was on this side. There's some bony information here that's standard. Whenever you're setting up the forearm in, in a certain position, you use the ulna as a major landmark. And that's really all I could find uh, that came to mind right away because size was good, movement was good, it's got the whole figure, things seem to relate to each other, the angles look good. But you made a lot of comparisons, found a lot of stuff. For this course, I need eight of those drawings, not finished, not with an overlay of tracing out muscle groups like tattoos and then applying that to your life drawing. I think that's artificial. I think rather than that is to begin to identify bone points that will help in two ways, bone points now and muscle structure later. Finding the bone points is going to help you with your drawing anyhow, finding where the pelvis is. And the other thing is that for this course particularly, you want to become so familiar with those as the agenda of the construction of the figure that it's part of your response to drawing or working from life anyhow. So the two are, are merged. We talked about that before. It's not like there's anatomy over here and, and figure drawing over here. They're one and the same. So to the extent you can begin to identify some of the stuff while you're drawing and setting up your drawing, you satisfy both of these elements, what, it, what exists out there for its construction and how you respond to it over here. Makes sense. Besides, it's going to be easier. Besides, you'll have it for life. Uh, so I can't collect these every time, but I did for the first few just to convey uh, some sense of what I was looking for and begin to prioritize things um, from the 
this standpoint, the standpoint of basically what is anatomical drawing. That's redundant, though, as far as I know. It's the same thing. Anywhere. It's yours. Yeah. Uh, I'm attempting, this is a little headline, I'm attempting to put together a, uh, call it a handbook, call it a draft, draftsman's handbook. And uh, it's not in ready form yet, but it's close. I just need to uh, find a way of, of getting this copied out. But so far I'm going with this. And uh, make these copies available and uh, for really not for the coffee table but for use. And a quick flip through. It has image and text. And it goes uh, through a whole lot of different stuff. Light and shade, concept of musculature, it's mostly images, bone points, uh, informing a drawing, making comparisons. I guess I'm giving a commercial here too. Uh, <laughs> I'm moving to the torso. That's today's subject. Construction lines other than the contour, all the way down to how I recommend that you hold the charcoal. Tentatively entitled Draftsman's Handbook. A resource and study guide for drawing from life. That may be a little long, but uh, it's getting there. It's time. I've been working on this for 12 years. It's time. There was a book in the, from the 14th century called The Craftsman's Handbook, written on painting. It's a classic from just post Giotto by a fellow named uh, Cianino Cianini. Craftsman's Handbook. So I figured Draftsman's Handbook is uh, lifting a little of his thunder and applying it to this enterprise. So we'll see what happens with this. But the idea would be to make not a book on lovely looking drawings, but on how you get there and what, what's practical and edit out all the uh, fancy looking stuff. That's, that's my intention. So that this information is, is commonplace and not just something that I have or Jerry Weiss has, but everybody has. And uh, it's in the works. I'm trying to get that done as soon as I can. What's your target date on here? Excuse me? What's your target date? When were you thinking about it? Well, it's about uh, pricing them now. I went to uh, a, a copy place and they, they could stitch them together with a binding that would work that I don't really like much. One of these spiral bindings for 12, 45 pages, both sides uh, for 12 something dollars. But I think the Danley Fund will contribute some to that so that it's much reduced. I'd love it if I could get it to about $2.60. <laughs> I'd love it. And then just get it out there and use it. Because it would help me, it would help you, and not be prohibitive, and not wind up on a coffee table because we don't want to a dullish looking color. You ought to talk to a paper company and see if you couldn't get them to print it. Put the name, put Stratton on the back bottom of it and do it for free. Possibility. We got a lot of different angles on this. Uh, I don't want to surrender too much control to anybody. That's the only thing. So, one of the topics there is on the movement of the torso, and it comes to mind because. We've already had 30 lectures in anatomy, most of you people, in anatomy one. And we talked about bone points, and we talked about this, and particularly torso. Torso is relevant whenever you're dealing with a figure, whatever the position, because everything itches to it, and if it fails to move, in some confusion about its bone points, and there's not that many, it will help every single time. So I thought I would do that and uh, identify for you uh, how it is that I think about it and how you can reference the material to the skeleton and then back to your drawing. 
when uh, I approached the figure, I am convinced now that if the torso fails to move, the torso is seen too monolithically, literally as one block, instead of its looking at it in terms of its two masses, then it's going to be trouble. And so the Bible on all of this was written by Bridgman. George Bridgman, Arts in the League, 1898 to 1943. Study with Jerome in Paris. And there are drawings in the Bridgman book called Constructive Anatomy that are very much simplified, that I'm simplifying even more, and that my teacher in Indianapolis simplified immensely. You can't get too much simpler than this, such that in this position, I'm saying this represents the pitch of the thorax, and this represents the pitch of the pelvis. The reason I'm promoting this and bringing attention to that is that Consider the alternative. The alternative is to straighten this up and straighten this up and pile them on top of each other and you wind up with one monolithic torso that doesn't have this capacity for movement. The reason that it is set up this way is because of the spine. How you turn that, you'll see it's four curves. It goes in to support the mass of the skull, comes back to accommodate the organs of the thorax, dives in significantly. Look at how far forward the bodies of the vertebrae are. Look at how far forward it is to support that which is above it. And then the final curve back here is the sacrum <coughs> and the organs of the pelvis. So, with, with this set up as ribcage and this set up as pelvis, my suggestion is this. And we can extend that and still be faithful to the bone points and construction of the figure by maybe changing the shape just slightly and changing this shape slightly. There is a high point to the pelvis, to the iliac crest. Linea alba, this white line that actually you don't 
don't see as a white line, only in a cadaver we can see that. But there is a division, courtesy of this median or middle line, such that there's a strap to which the side muscles can actually attach. The deep muscle coming across here is transverse, coming from both sides. But it has to have something to attach to. So that when it pulls this way, it pulls against something and you can compress your abdomen. Yeah. In simple terms, this is section number one, that's sternum. This is section number two, that's the upper abdominal muscles. And that ends essentially opposite the, the end of the rib cage. And the last piece is lower abdomen. And that has its origin as a muscle on the pubic bone of the uh, pelvis. The origin for the uh, correctus abdominis muscle comes from this here, and its insertion is to the cartilage of ribs five, six, and seven. Uh, here, here, and here. And so as it ascends, it divides slightly to tie on to the cartilage there, which is why you don't see a division down here, but you can up here because it's dividing as it goes up, splitting apart, anchoring these planes. Now what happens here is that the, the, body, the body of the vertebrae, these, and the, even the spinous processes of the vertebrae, of the spinal column, these, disappear into a valley because there are large post muscles of the back, that's what we used to call them, that hide all this so that the shape here is curved and then it goes straight and then curved again. And anyhow, when I was starting drawing myself, I wondered in drawing from life, whatever happened to this bumpiness in here? And you look at a model and all you see are two columns with a valley right here where there are bumps on the skeleton. It's because there are these two post muscles that go up called the erector spinae muscles that will hide where this is. In this schematic view, we're keeping this pitch Remember the box that I drew here? We're keeping this pitch in the box I drew here. And the merit of paying attention to this median line is that the pitch, the twist, the, the pull forward in space that you're going to get in this zone more often than not, this axis is recorded in the abdominal wall, more often than not. So if you pay attention to the, to the forms that come down, following this median line, median meaning middle, that here, the sternum is going to give you the pitch of the thorax, not something you have to x-ray, it's right on the surface, it's right here. It's here. And then uh, the abdominal wall is going to give you the pitch of the pelvis, which is here. And so in studying this line, this median line, you're going to get information on how this relates to that in a good way because they're not going to be in line with each other. This line isn't going to go like this. This line isn't going to go like this. In a standing figure, more often than not, this face is the floor, and this face is the ceiling. If your posture is any good, mine's terrible. If my posture is any good, and this is facing up, and abdominal wall is facing the floor at an angle, when you're sitting, it can reverse. You can have uh, this facing the floor and this facing up when you're seated. But the idea is to Unhitch this. <coughs> Don't think of this in a monolithic way. Mono means one, and lithic, lithic coming from lithos stone, one block. Before I leave this diagram, there's just a few bone points that you're going to find on the figure that are worth finding every single time because it'll help you with your drawing. Sounds like anatomy is over here, and life drawing is over there. Think of it as if they're emerging somehow. The 
This is major. Finding this. Iliac crest. It's essential. You have to find it. You have to find it. Find it. If you have a posterior view, you can still find it. Because you use the triangle of the sacrum and you follow that triangle right out and it will guide you right onto the iliac crest. We'll talk about that in another view. So this becomes a major bone point and this becomes a major bone point, right? Here. Right here. And I can't show you its relation to the other side because I have a profile here, but obviously all those drawings we got in the hallway and you've done, you're relating one side to the other to determine how this is pitched laterally. One side up, one side down. It's not just this way, but how it's rocking this way or this way. As we shift from one leg to the other, it's going to rock back and forth. This is major because it's the start of the torso from the point of view of setting this all up in the anterior view, in the front view, the the bone and pelvis. This line should continue down to here. The muscle does. This also is major. Those are the three. This is where the leg's going to start. As the leg hitches on the ear, this spot is this spot. I, I had my charcoal-covered fingers on this so many times, there are two little black spots right here. This is where the leg starts. One way to think about this is that the in interior of the pelvis, meaning the basin, supports the whole thorax. And exterior of the pelvis belongs to the muscles of the hip and the leg, inside, outside. But for our purposes, we've got a model posing, we have a lights on, we have a chance to identify this stuff and not have to feel like we x-ray the whole thing and draw all these vertebrae. You don't have to do that. You can get the information you need to tip this and turn it and make it move for you by looking at a few bone points. What we used to do here is simply to go through here to where the trochanter is, and then hitch on a hip and leg. See where I'm starting the leg?
Three quarter view, anterior, meaning front. As I am looking at the skeleton now. Let's get this to, let's keep this stable. Usually, you know, if you shift your weight, you do this, and you shift over here, you do this, and so shoulders rock some. To stand this way is tough. You walk your leg and keep it straight. You tend to want to do this, and then you shift around, so this generally moves too, as a consequence of standing and the torso holds But let's keep that stable. But turn it so that we've got more on this side showing and less on this side, meaning that I want to start the supersternal notch further to this side and come down and just take a chance on forecasting this line change and this one to here to, to acknowledge the direction of these two blocks <laughs> sternum sideway process you may or may not show upper abdomen lower abdomen This facing up to a slight degree, this facing the floor to a slight degree. With two lines, I have a lot of information on this torso and a lot of bone points. And I'm going to keep this fairly stable too, as if the figure were not doing this sort of thing, but we're fairly evenly disposed, weight on both legs. What I'm looking for over here is a line that will give me the pitch of the pelvis, and I'm looking for this. There's a number of ways of finding that, which I'll share with you. You've got to find them. You have this view. And I'm trying to edit out any wild uh, twisting and turning here to try to just talk about the, these basic bone points. So I have a chromian process, a chromian process, this as a bone point. I have a line that connects the two, that's what ACRO as a prefix means. Then I have a supersternal notch. That's a little symbol for this shape. That little U shape, it's a symbol for this shape. I can't take the time to draw the whole maneuverium here when I have this whole figure to do. But in place of that, I put this little symbol there to mark. Then I'm coming down to sternum, and my thought here is, as I've shown you before, is conceive of the upper body as a block like shape. this facing up. If my posture were any good, like that, this facing up. And then I'm coming down here and my thought is that this is facing down. There's my block like shape of pose. I used to try to draw these and then fit the figure to it. It's too geometric. And I look at the figure, it's all curvilinear. And I look at this and it's all rectilinear and the one doesn't fit well with the other. This is in my head, if not on the page. And this plane facing down. So, let me lighten it. I can summarize the notion that's contained in this little drawing by thinking that there are two masses, not just one. <coughs> that's from Bridgman, that's not just me. All right, now we need something to look at here, something for the upper body, and then we'll find out where we are now.
begin to come around on the shape of the rib cage. The direction of this line is echoed in the shape of the external oblique muscle, the little flank muscle at the side. And if ever you're confused about finding where this is, these two bony references on the anterior plane of the figure, in front of the feet. A number of ways for you to find out. You see where ribcage ends, and then there's a space, and then there's an iliac crest with a bone point. Same thing on the other side. Ribcage ends, space, iliac crest, bone point. In that space, which I have here, is where you're going to find ribcage, waist or end of ribcage, the space, and the bone point. Well, the space is filled by the external oblique muscle. That's all. Both sides. I told you the torso fits, is braced into the pelvis. Fitting here, here, and in the basin itself. On some models, you won't be able to find the bone point, but if you find this shape, you'll find where that bone point is. And in comparing the one side to the other, you'll know where you are. Besides, if you're bold, you can say to the model, please, could you find these two, show them, find these two bone points by just pushing against and seeing where they are. If you do that, you can find it this way too. Now, somewhere into here, I have pelvis. I think I'm going to keep it box-like shape because it keeps the planes separate and it's consistent with what I'm giving you so far. in order here because we have this against this. This is sternum, which we suggested was pretty much a good marker for the pitch of the thorax. And we have abdominal wall, which is not a bad marker for the pitch of the pelvis, which is this. And that's all part of this median line. To hitch on the legs. Remember, it's not about hitching the legs up to here. You have to drop down a little bit. Even if you don't draw it this way, you're thinking this, because this will inform your drawing. So we're coming down to here. It's not that many bone points to think about. It's one, two, 
three, four, five. This one, this one, this one. And these when you're thinking about the legs, because the leg will hitch on what? Schematically. This becomes hip, this becomes leg. I go too fast. You've seen this flat plane before you come out on the leg. There's a drop here. Don't chain the leg up to here. There are two muscles, but they're minor. They start from here that belong to the leg. The sartorius went through here, but it's skinny. It's like a ribbon. And then over here, there's a muscle called the tensor muscle that comes down and comes down the shaft of the leg. It helps you lock the leg. Uh, I'm going to do, well, I should do one more quick drawing and then false here. We can find it for sure. Um, uh, if I've drawn this line on any of your diagrams, uh, any of the critique drawings, then you know what that is. That's connecting this anterior superior iliac spine. Anterior meaning in front. Superior means it's above. Above what? Above this. Iliac spine. They use spine not just for the spine and the vertebrae, but spine as a um, let's see, what else do I need to point out here? Posterior view, I don't, I, we could go into, but it's the same situation, just turned around. The bone points in the back, I, I mentioned, but we can find them on call. It's, uh, if you find the sacrum, you look to see if the little shadow that's going to occur here, little half tone, little half tone occur here, and the half tone occur here, that making a triangle. All I do is find those and watch to see how this might be tipped in the posterior view. You'll find these three points and follow this out. Find where the pelvis is. Just follow this right up and up. It just continues. It launches out. It starts from here, comes up. You find those two points, keeps on going. Reaches its high point rather soon and flares out as it goes forward. But I don't want to confuse this. I could, I could say that in order to find this most important, I'm going to end on this, and then we, we can look at it in one. To find these most important points, you can find it, if, if you can't see the points on the model, you can find it by using this form. If for some reason this is confused and you're looking for this, then you've got to develop some other strategy for finding this bone point, this set of bone points. Then work your way up from the leg. Find where this point is and work your way up from it. Because the leg, is, the mass of the leg is going to start a little below this. Another way is to ask the model, show them on the skeleton what you're looking for and ask them to find it somehow. Uh, even in a seated figure, where this gets compressed into here, there's still going to be a little a skin fold here to indicate that the forms don't go all the way to here, but will go up to here. If the, the leg is coming out this way. Main thing is about the major blocks in the pelvis. So I want to put Drawing back up and uh, and then we'll look set this up for a second and look at it in nature.